Hi everyone, uh, tonight it's my pleasure to introduce Renelle Hobson of ASA, the Academy of Sport Speed Australia, Australia. or possibly Asia. Uh, and so Renelle and, and I and Kip uh, met recently at the Expo uh, in Singapore. We had a ball, didn't we? We absolutely had so much fun. So our, our topic, the particular topic we were together on is, is the ice age over? And we were talking about uh, the use of ice and recovery, and which was kind of part of, uh, part, really a, a beginning really, because we introduced to you some of our products, some of our recovery systems product, and you kind of liked it. I you? absolutely loved it, <laughs> yeah. So we were, we were talking about all aspects of recovery, um, and compression of course being one of those. Yes, yeah, so now I know that uh, we're, Australia has a winter that's a lot cooler than here, and that using, uh, using our gear for a warm-up for athletes and, and for yourself is actually not a bad idea when it's like 10 degrees outside. Yeah, absolutely. Certainly gets that blood flowing. Yes, and then again, after a session, it's also, also great. So, well, the reason why we've got you here is, and we're really delighted to have you, is that you've, I think you've got some real gems for endurance athletes because endurance athletes hardly ever think about explosiveness, speed, and so on. And really they need to, because yeah. uh, in, in a lot of races, a lot of situations, they're going, s slowing down into a corner, then they're having to accelerate out, mm. if I'm thinking about cycling yeah. in, in the sport of triathlon, for, in, for example. And you've got to muster enough explosiveness yeah. and uh, deal with it in a way that the, you can then settle back down into your race pace. So I'm really fascinated to hear your views on tips yeah. for endurance. Well, athletes. I mean, speed means something different for every athlete, doesn't it? Yeah. I mean, if you're an explosive athlete where your event goes for 10 seconds, <laughs> or if you're an endurance trail runner or a triathlete yes. where your event goes for hours and hours, speed is going to mean something different. Yeah. And I think the big thing for me is that speed in uh, endurance events is not just about those explosive powerful movements that are needed to perhaps take the lead or burst away from a group um, or come around a specific bend as you were talking about but it's also about energy efficiency yeah um, and it's all about having the speed mechanics in place so that you're much more of an efficient athlete so that you get to the finish line much faster than you would normally now mechanics so i see on your video i see some very interesting torture like positions you are getting people into and it's basically to to improve because let's face it all bodies are not the same exactly and so you need to take what you've been given mm -hmm. and then create the best possible mechanical movement to create speed power and and endurance in our case so yes. give us some thoughts and i saw a lot of bands i saw a lot of i'm, I'm going to call it parachute uh, towing people on yeah so bungees bungee, using bungee, yes, bungee yes. recoils give us, so, give us a heads up on that okay so with the bungee recoils I'll use them for either acceleration or for um, so as in towing the athlete yep. but I'll also use them for resistance yes. um, so especially for glute quad um, strength and power we can use that for any athlete of any age to get some strength into them um, and to give them in terms of towing or a short, a short acceleration we can get them to move their muscles at a faster pace than they're accustomed to by assisting the nervous system to pull them through those stuff, those stride cycles. Yep. Um, the bands that you were talking about, banded restriction, uh, distraction work that I use, yes. um, that's for example if I've got an athlete and because of the continuous training that they're doing, the volume of training that they're doing, their pelvis might be a little bit out of alignment. So now because that pelvis is a little bit out of alignment, you've got uneven force loading through both feet. And if you continue with that as an endurance athlete, you're gonna completely break down and you're gonna be spending more time at the physiotherapist um, than you are actually on the road doing work. We love our physios, but really our mandate <laughs> as coaches is to uh, is to spot the work that needs to be done for prehab because an ounce of prehab is worth a pound of rehab, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and and uh, also I've I've really found that selling that story to my athletes has been how much do you love the sport? Oh, I really love it. What if you had to take six months off? Mm. And they go, oh no, I couldn't cope with that. Well, let's let's start working on your rehab, yeah. right? 
So when I'm doing the mechanics training with the athletes, um, and that's for speed or endurance, any speed of running whatsoever, um, if I see an imbalance between left and, and right side pelvic mechanics, yeah. I can use the bands yeah. to distract the actual bone. So for example, um, it's a method that's been used for hundreds of years, but for example, if I have a, a femur, the head of the femur, the greater trochanter, if that's sitting forward onto the pelvis, then that athlete's gonna get a lot of hip impingement. So you can do various stretches and mobilization work where you put the band, really nice strong strength band around the head of the femur yep. and just gently tease it back into the middle of the hip joint. And then you get that even amount of force going through both legs again. So just by being able to identify that as a coach um, and being able to fix it on the spot for the athlete allows them then to get through the training session without pain and without causing any injury. Yep. Um, and so we talk about you know, sideline therapy. We talk about, you know, just through the session being able to identify those niggles, those sore points, yep. and endurance athletes have a lot of them. They do. Yes. Now, let's talk about some of the athletes, some of the teams, some of the sports that you've been working with. Um, so I work with a lot of individual athletes across a wide range of sports. Um, in terms of teams, I've been working with the GWS Fury Premier League for four years now. Um, been working with Sydney Blue Sox and New South Wales Baseball. Um, but the rest of the, our team contracts, um, but the rest of the work is one-on-one. -on -one and I'll work in uh, rugby league, rugby union, AFL, baseball, um, tennis players, netball players, soccer players. And soccer players make up a huge chunk of my week. Um, so it's a lot, all the athletes. Athletes. We look at um, in the past with triathletes, even people that are preparing for the army where they have to run large amounts of kilometers, do yep. it in a certain set time. Um, marathon runners, um, think of um, um, what are they called? Trail runners. Yes, ultra, um, ultra running. Ultra, trail run, running. ultra running trail yes, runners. So yep. basically, anyone that needs to run in their sport. Yeah. Um, they will come to me to help them with their mechanics, with their speed, and with their all-round. Um, yeah, coaching through those areas. Let's distill this. I know a lot of the folks that are going to be listening to this video are going to be triathletes, mm. cyclists, Spartan racers, and ultra runners. Just just as a look, and I, and I know there's going to be some rugby folks as well, but let's get a little specific on some tips based on what you've seen sure. and the folks that you've uh, worked with the biggest thing with the, the endurance athletes is making sure that they've got enough hip extensor strength to to actually power the stride right. so one of the things that i find is a lot of endurance athletes sit low through the pelvis um, so if you can add some strength and conditioning elements to your training where you're really working on hip extensor thrust movements then that will actually increase the stride length and so you actually get to your destination, whatever length that is, uh, whatever distance that is, you get to that destination with a shorter number of strides. Yeah. Um, and that decreases the total volume or loading on the body. So some specifics, would that involve bridging? Bridging, um, I really like to use a sandbag or some sort of weighted um, right. equipment on the hips when we're doing actual hip thrusts. Right. So the exercise where your shoulders are up on a bench, you've got a barbell, a sandbag, anything that you can use yep. um, to yeah, get up into that bridge, that high hip thrust position. Is it explosive up, slow down? Explosive up and slow down is a beautiful way to do it. You can also do um, ex uh, the exercise where you're playing with the tempo. Right. So you might want to do two counts up, two counts down, really manipulate the way in which the fibers through the glute max are actually working. But yeah. explosive up is always going to get you that beautiful explosive stride. So uh, some of my observations with cyclists, I see a lot once they're under load, you can see if you're following them from behind, there's a hip height discrepancy. There's mm. a whole lot of compensation going on. I think not only for runners, that's a great one for the cyclists as Absolutely. well. Absolutely, and the problem, well not the problem, but the challenge that cyclists face is that they're always in a hip flexed position. Yeah. So those hip flexes are gonna get very short very quickly. Yes. And then what happens is the glute is always in an elongated position. So for them, it's a corrective exercise. Yeah. So using the hip thrust to actually correct um, poor, uh, well, poor, Oh no, I shouldn't say poor. <laughs> but because they're always in a seated position, yes, they yep. end up usually it's, walking around with poor mechanics yep. because the hip flexors get so short. Yeah, so you, can, you can tell the like because they're walking bent over. Yeah, so mobilizing that Guilty. front chain, yep. strengthening the back chain, yes. and then you've got a better well-rounded athlete. Yeah, so sometimes, and we talked about, you came up with a term at Expo that I really like. Microdosing. Yes, microdosing. So not everyone likes to take their medicine in one big hit, mm. uh, but 
um, you explain the concept of microdosing for folks that don't like to uh, do the remedial. Work. Look, microdosing is one of those fabulous things because it allows athletes to achieve results yep. um, over a period of time with like five or eight minutes of attention paid to a specific um, stimulus yes. throughout the week. Yep. So it might be that you know they just go, okay, I really don't want to do any strength and conditioning work, but I'm going to jump in. And I'm going to do eight minutes a day. Yep. That eight minutes a day calculates over time yep. to where they're getting some really great results. So I love that marginal gains compound over time. Time. Absolutely, and, they do. And yeah. uh, they, they, marginal gains are quite often the difference between a podium or not, and which position on the podium that you're yeah, uh, going absolutely. to be. Yeah, absolutely. Or even personal best, because not everyone uh, may achieve a podium, but it may yeah. be. It may be just, ground, you know, uh, achieving a personal best. Yeah, well, over success time. is different for everyone as well. Absolutely. Just like speed is different for everyone. That's a very healthy way to look at things. Yeah, don't you think? I mean, <laughs> I mean, it could be that it's your first triathlon. Yeah. And so, for you, getting to the finish line unscathed, that's your measure of success. There you go. And that's a fabulous one. Now, our countries, Australia, New Zealand, mm -hmm. and yes, we do love each other. You know, and lots uh, of love. Yeah, lots of love. Now, uh, the average age of Australia, New Zealand, and Singapore is quite similar it's high 30s low you know up towards close to 40 years old so mobility and healthy movement as we age is an important aspect which mm. in, and so it doesn't matter you're dealing with uh, you're dealing with 15 year old athletes you're dealing with 25 year old athletes yeah. and we've we're finding here we're seeing in Asia a lot of older athletes are um, coming into the sport for the first time or yeah. some of them have been competing for a while so keeping them in the game longer yeah and aspects of what you're talking yeah, about mobilization mo mobilization yeah particularly in one-dimensional sports where things tend to lock up like yeah. you were saying yeah mobilization is key mobilization is really just saying i'm going to make sure that i've got good joint integrity i'm going to make sure that i'm maintaining my muscle tissue integrity i'm going to make sure that i'm keeping the length of the muscles because they go through so much forceful shortening contractile efforts right. through training yep. um, and through competition that i'm going to return them back to their original length okay. after training and competition um, and so it's about saying, okay, I'm going to make sure that the muscles are pulling all on my skeleton uh, evenly. So I've got symmetry across the board. Yeah. And when you've got symmetry across the board and you've got good integrity of muscle fibers and, and tissue, yeah. then you're going to be able to maintain your career in that sport for much longer. Yeah. So it's not just about recovery. It's not just about injury prevention, but it's about longevity in your sport as well yeah. and being able to do what you love for as long as you want to be able to do that. And mobilization is just... Key. So we talked about bridging. Yes. What other key mobilization uh, activities do you think yeah. people should be building in to their yeah. to their visits to the gym or even at home? That eight minute micro dose. Yes, <laughs> eight minutes. So bridging is a strength exercise. Yep. And then the mobilization for the pelvic girdle again. So the two biggest areas that we see lots of issues in with all athletes across the board, pelvic girdle and calf complex. If you look at endurance athletes, the calf complex gets very short very quickly. Um, they get problems with Achilles um, issues. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Especially as they start to age. Yep. Over 40, the Achilles becomes a real problem um, because it loses its elasticity. Mm -hmm. um, and so we need to make sure that we're maintaining calf complex, ankle complex movement. We need to make sure that we're spending, you know, six minutes a day on the hips, two minutes a day on the calf complex. Yeah. Um, and in the hips, it's in all areas. So you want to make sure that you've got full joint mobility through the, the actual um, pelvic girdle or through the hip structure. Yeah, big for runners, massive for runners. Absolutely. Runners too. Big yeah. endurance runners get all of this tight fascia just sitting below the glutes. So if we think about proximal hamstring area, mm -hmm. um, that you know gets really knotted up quite a lot with endurance athletes, um, especially the runners. And so we need to find a way to actually break down those fascial restrictions yep. and keep that tissue healthy. So um, I, I get asked this question a lot. Do, do we, as a... Uh, a company promoting recovery through active compression does that replace a massage and I say no it doesn't mm. so you know the evil massage where you're crying uh, yes. where there's elbows going nice into deep places. tissue <laughs> yeah so that's that's entirely necessary to maintain the um, or to break down the scarring and to yeah. to give the opportunity for the muscle to lengthen out yeah. again to behave 
like yeah. it's supposed to, right? I mean, there's so many home-based tools that you can use now as well. Yeah. So you can be sitting down on your, um, you know, on your living room floor using, you know, a foam roller that's got really nice hard dorsal fins in it. Yeah. And sitting on top of that and scrubbing that proximal hamstring left and right. Yes. And scrubbing forward and back to break up those fascial restrictions. You can use acu balls. You can use even just a hard lacrosse ball or you yeah. know anything yeah. just to get into that and break it up. So sooner or later, everyone watches TV, and this is something you should be doing. Yes. And like I say to my athletes, I the the thing that I've got gotten back from my athletes over the years has been, but coach, I don't have time. And to which to which I will say to them, well, look, I've given you a 90 minute session, so carve out 10 minutes of that 90. It's still 90 minutes yeah. to do the necessary things that are going to make a difference from a marginal yeah. gains point of view. Look, I'll give you another handy hint. Postural integrity. So if you think about all anyone who runs, and it doesn't matter if you run 60 meters or if you run 100 kilometers, anywhere in between, postural integrity is probably the next thing that you need to be aware of. So strength from head to toe, making sure that there's not too much slack and collapse do you yep. know what I mean? Upon the ground when you actually yep. cre um, have foot strike. Yes. Um, and making sure that the core is nice and strong, shoulder blades can be held down and back, and pelvis can be held in a nice position. Yeah. It allows the legs to work freely as scissors underneath the leg and give you that beautiful stride cycle. So that, again, it comes back to efficiency. Yeah. Mobility, strength, technique, all comes back to being an efficient endurance athlete. Very good. Well, look, um, it's been great to have you. And I know that you're speaking tomorrow. Uh, you're training uh, a fit SG, fitness SG. That's correct, yes. And you're training uh, the fitness community on how to help folks that are my age. Yeah, <laughs> a little bit older than you, I think. Yeah, senior strength and conditioning. Yeah, senior yes. strength and conditioning. Yes. What a great thing because we are... You know, we're in a, um, a, a time where we are living longer, mm. uh, but the question mark is, what's the quality? Yes, exactly. And, and so we, we really look forward to your impact, and it's been great to have you here. Hopefully this is the first of many chats. I would love to have more chats. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we, we thanks for tuning in, and we're uh, really grateful to have Renal here, and also Kip. Uh, who's uh, let's let's give a shout out to Kip who does a lot for your business, right? Absolutely. Kip who, basically who is manages. Kip, by the way? Kip is my husband, um, and Kip basically manages everything that I do. Yep. So if I turn up to a conference, if I'm teaching a course, yep. if I'm rocking up to teach a, a, a group of athletes, Kip would have organised that. Oh. Um, so he does all of my scheduling, all of my planning, and I wouldn't get anywhere without him. That's wonderful. Yes. So partnerships rock. Absolutely. All right, so thanks everyone, and uh, we look forward to the next time you join us on Recovery Systems Tips.